Welcome again to lecture five of the Chua lecture series at uh, Hewlett Packard Labs. Uh, I failed miserably in, in uh, interpreting the uh, title, so I have no idea of what the actual title for today's talk is, but you will find out uh, very soon. And so uh, without any further ado, let's welcome uh, Leon to the stage. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, did anybody figure out who, how to had decoded that? Well, uh, you will in a second if you haven't. And, uh, but before that, I just want to tell the folks uh, tuning in that uh, um, I know many of you are out there and I can see you. I appreciate if you would respond to what I'm requesting. Okay, uh, the, this turns out to be the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic for the brain. And uh, this was the oldest known written record of any scientific, well, not quite scientific yet, but somebody that really uh, poked into the brain and tried to figure out how the brain works, any particular memory, all kinds of things. And it has to do, is, this is about 17, 1007, 100 BC, so we're talking about almost 4,000 years ago. You recall the Egyptians were also the first one in my second lecture told you about the invention of the calendar was the Egyptian is about 6,000 years ago, and this is about 4,000 years ago when uh, someone actually uh, wrote down on the pap papyrus uh, a, a diagnosis of two patients. Uh, so apparently he must be a, a, a neurosurgeon of some type that, that uh, look at two patients whose skull was cracked open. And, and, and then sort of was, I would say, the first recorded history of brain being seriously studied. And it's been more than almost 4,000 years, and we're still at the tip of the iceberg. We just knew so little. And uh, so what I'm gonna try to say today is a bit of history and a bit of how the memory so would come in and then how it would lead to the next lecture, where we'll be done with memory, um, and we're gonna start with cellular neural network, which is sort of to imitate a part of what we know about the brain, and, and, and that can make it technical. So, so this is the reason for this, and toward the end of, uh, during the discussion, I'm gonna talk a bit about a more of what I call a poetic uh, interpretation of memory, and it has to do, and in fact, can I, as for 180, 181, uh, I believe, five, 181. Uh, okay, so I said it's a poetic characterization of memory stall. And it, uh, how many of you have known about the book about Marcel Proust, Remembrance of Things Past? Great. Well, those of, who didn't, you, of you who didn't know, this is a 3,000 page book. It's, a, it's amazing. It's probably one of the greatest novels ever written. And people, th many people thought it's even better than Shakespeare's uh, volume. And the amazing thing is that he's a novelist, he does, he's an scientist, and yet he's the first person, and he was, he was preceded Pablo, you know, he heard Pablo, the associate, the, the dog, uh, with the meat, with, you know, uh, with, with the sounds, two different senses. And he got a Nobel Prize just for that, but he could, he, he could not tell what part of the brain is doing that. Amazingly, amazingly, Marcel Proust, even though not a scientist, was so perceptive, he was able to identify the smell <coughs> and the taste and pinpoint, although he didn't know the name, the hippocampus, which is now acknowledged, the scientific proven to be the, the main place where memory is formed. So this is why we're gonna come back to, toward the end, a discussion and go a bit into uh, this wonderful book, okay? All right, so let me go back to now. Uh, well, can I go back to the beginning now? Uh, okay, so this, this is the uh, hieroglyphic for brain. So uh, this lecture five is all about brain, especially about memory and how memory so comes in. So let's, let's uh, assume that um, not all of you know enough about the brain, so I'm gonna start with very elementary, 
the brain, everybody know we have two halves, they're identical. And uh, normally when things are symmetrical, left and right, and I call this the left-right symmetry, we're going to come back toward the very end uh, of the last two lectures, by the way, where we're going to talk about this, what I call left-right symmetry, so you might as well get used to it. And normally you would expect to be the same behavior if everything's the same, all the cells are the same, and yet there's such a thing called symmetry breaking. And the consequence, this is a consequence of local activity. So this is all weaved together. That's why I'm showing this. Because of local activity, all kinds of things uh, happen. Symmetry is broken. And the, so you have a left brain and light, right brain that anatomically look alike, and yet they have totally different things. For example, the left brain is specialized for performing serial logic operations, whereas the right brain is specialized for performing holistic or we can analog. So we have digital on the left and analog on the right. The left hemisphere, in other words, the left, you know, excels in reading, writing, and processing information in a sequential fashion, that digital. The left hemisphere is now deals with languages, logic, number crunching. On the right, however, the right hemisphere is specialized for recognizing faces, drawings, or reading maps, or solving jigsaw puzzles, and expressing and perceiving the emotional nuances accompanying verbal and facial expressions. The right hemisphere is responsible for patterns. We're going to talk a lot about patterns later on. Spatial awareness, creativity, and musical talent. Now, the, how, do we, how do we know that? Well, it turns out that the simplest proof that the left brain and right brain uh, have two different functions is what I call the Japanese brain syndrome. Uh, this is... Uh, at, at, at the, the, the Japanese version of the Chua circuit. And you can see that the, there are two kinds of symbols there. Uh, the, uh, the green part that I mark up are called the kana, and the kana is on the left. Uh, that's, that, those, are, that, those are alphabet. And then the right is a, a kanji. So the Japanese language are made up of two parts, the Chinese like kanji and the alphabetic kana. And it turns out that uh, some poor Japanese got into a car accident and damaged the left uh, half of the brain, uh, can no longer read kana, but it can read the kanji perfectly, and vice versa, those Japanese who uh, damaged the right damage because of some accident could no longer read Chinese characters. And, 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 and this tells you, by the way, why it took already 4,000 years and we still know so little. It's because uh, we, we cannot use mouse or monkeys as guinea pigs. We've got to have, use human, you know, to be able to tell what's going on, and you have to wait for accidents you know, like that, to be able to begin to understand what, what, what's what, what's doing what, what part of the brain is doing what thing, okay? Okay, now, so our brain, by the way, as most of you know, contains uh, 10 to 11, 100 billion nerve cells, and just to get a feeling, 100 now million mixer is essentially, our Milky Way's galaxy is composed of approximately the same number of stars, that's what we have. You know, you, 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 the number of neuro, neuro, neurons is about the same as the number of stars in the Milky Way. And this is just a snapshot of one of them. And we already showed uh, in my early lecture that uh, from the information processing perspective, the synapses and the axons are essentially made of memory store. This is why the connection is, okay? And ba basically, if you put uh, an electrode into it on the right side, and, and in steady state, you measure about minus 70 millivolt, okay? And, but all those dendrites are probing, connect, communicating, talking to the neighbors. The neighbors are all the neurons that, that make contact. And the, if, the, if enough of the neighbors is sending some signal, uh, I say enough, you have to get a trace and threshold, and then boom, something will happen, and you have the, the all or nothing, on, uh, in the all or none phenomena, what's called the action potential. And we can simulate this by putting a current source, uh, injecting a current source, that's the equivalent of that, and that's how this, all this uh, research on, on, on brain, the heart screen actually is, it's just injecting a current. And we would do the same thing as well today. Okay, by the way, 70 millivolts is about, well, for those of you who want to have a feeling, you take 20 of those uh, double A battery, that's what our resting potential is. And then, so to so take two memory stores, and the, 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 the output of the axon on the upper half is uh, sort of connected or, in, or, 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 at, or at, uh, sort of making contact, information contact to the next one, to the, uh, and that's called a synapse. And 
For a long time, the burning issue in the early 19th century is uh, there was a majority of the people, including Gorgi, uh, who got a Nobel Prize, insisted that this is all one connected, like a fish net. And then there's Cajal, uh, you know, Ramon Cajal from Spain, who insisted that it's actually, there's a gap. And, and eventually, by, by, by nine, they were making, both making so much contribution that they both were awarded the Nobel Prize in 1906, which was the year of the San Francisco earthquake, by the way. So that was a major event. And that, in fact, is probably written by most people as the beginning of real science on the brain. It, uh, begins in 1906. Okay. Now, uh, last time I already told you that the, the issue of whether there's a gap or it was all connected is through this dream of Otto Louis. And I'm showing this again because I, I, there was, I discovered there was a mistake in the graph, in the second one, that doesn't make much sense. So, so uh, uh, Lowy had a dream, as I mentioned last time, uh, that, that uh, he could answer the question, the burning question, whether, whether the, the, the synapse is, are connected to the, to the action or there's a gap. And his, the dream said, tell him to go cut up two hearts of a frog and put them in two different bezels. And with the solution, this is just some, some, called a ringer solution, which is just salt solution, uh, seawater, basically. And the, the heart will continue to beat on the left side, the heart one, and they beat it regularly. And then he would, the dream says, yeah, he's just connect an electric, uh, you know, electric signal into the, uh, the, the vagus brain. The vagus brain, those big brains that you see in the vein of, of the old ladies with this little blue vein, those are called vagus brain. If you put in a signal there, you are, it, it will send in some molecules that will slow down the heart. So you can see it on top. The, it, it was slower because of the electrical uh, input. But the second heart, there is no electrical input or anything, remains beating at the same rate. So the, the, rain, the brain says, uh, the dream suggested that, why don't you just connect a channel and, and see what happened? And so let you go, he, Louis connect a channel, and all, all of a sudden, the right heart start to slow down and beat exactly in synchronism as the left heart. So this proves that the, there is not electricity, but no, no electrical signal go there. It's got to be the molecule. That settles the issue, okay? So this is, as I said, the, the only Nobel Prize that I knew that came from a dream. Okay, all right, so now uh, you have this uh, <clears throat> a section of uh, neurons with all those uh, uh, wires connecting to each other. And uh, this is just zeroing at one. This is a real picture now. All those red dots uh, behind are the synapses that the neighbors make contact with this particular neuron, so, so they're talking, okay? And if enough of those red dots, every one of them is a synapse, if none of them are send signal and exceed the threshold, you would have this, that, at least another picture, same thing, okay? Uh, you would have this boom thing, just like uh, the one on the right side, some, like something that's lighting up. Uh, this is just, just a cartoon showing uh, that you need to exceed a certain threshold. But you, have, you need many of them, and you know, the, the way the brain evolves is, is clever. You know, you don't use a single one with a lot of cells. You have many of them, and it's very bit. And then you, when the threshold is seated, you have this action potential. And it's a bit like, you know, you're blowing up, a modern world blowing up a building, uh, is to put in many, many small charges and distribute it uh, around it, and not just one big one. And then uh, once you have enough of them, Calculate properly, it would just uh, gently, gracefully sort of uh, ignite that uh, thing. In some sense, the, 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 the neurons move, uh, ex, uh, uh, the action potential is excited by the same way, okay? Now, I want to remind you that, that uh, the, the, the single, the, uh, there's a great opportunity, by the way, for, especially for biology, doing ion channel dynamics now, because if, uh, I try to recall that the single ion potassium in, in, in the old days, in the night, early 1900s, the, 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 the big, uh, uh, the, the well known scientist, most well known one, is uh, Julius Bernstein. And he proposed what's called a one ion, just, just potassium, on uh, explaining how this action potential is created. That, was, that lasted, that theory lasted for 50 years, even though everyone knew that it was inadequate. 
because there wasn't anything better. So for 50 years, everybody, there was a mistake, but, but that's the best available. Then came Husky and Huxley in 1952, and it was equally lasting. Now it's more than 50 years now, and, 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 and uh, uh, they're still thinking about this. Uh, this is still taught in school, all these time-varying conductances. And we now know that that's not correct. It's the membristo doing all the, 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 the real making is the membristo. So I said there's a great opportunity for the bio is, uh, inspired research that start to call a spade a spade. And that's where progress should be made. So now let's start with the, the, the Huskins Huxley. And I, again, let me emphasize that this is the, a, a wonderful model and remain to be the, the best model available. It's only the interpretation that was wrong. So there's, otherwise there's nothing else wrong and it continues to be the best model. And they very much deserve the, the, uh, the Nobel Prize. And it all started with uh, this, called a Lodigo uh, squid axon. And this particular axon is known for a very big, uh, I mean this squid, a very big uh, giant axon. Uh, so big it's about almost a half a millimeter. You can actually see it with your eye. So you can put an electro in there and make measurement in, the, in that days, in the old days, in the, in the 50s, this is a, 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 an important advantage. That's why Huxley Huxley did experiment on the squid action. And uh, you can, in the left side, you can see this that's called giant action, that's what it is. And you can see that that's the, the approximate size of, of uh, one millimeter, and then you have an electrode inserted in there. That's how this experiment was carried out. And Hassan actually liked to say that in the end of the day, they had calamari. <laughs> so you can actually uh, have their cake and eat it too. That was, that was the great thing about it. Okay. Uh, by the way, so, um, and through their experiments and, and a great insight, Hassan, Hassan was able to, to postulate, they, they never seen it, that there must be ion channels, several kinds of ion, but most predominant must be the sodium ion and the potassium ion. It's just posture, they, they never seen it, but, but they, were, they were correct, you know? And so they came up with the model and uh, came up not only with the model, but with painstaking work, uh, came up with a four differential equation, you can see that they're, 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 they're very, very messy, but, and they are empirical. This is just remarkable inside of these two gentlemen, you know, that able to do that. And not only that, in the 50s and or the late uh, uh, 40s, there were no computer, and they were able to c calculate this very nonlinear equation using just kind of desk calculator. It took a week, for example, just to calculate this one action potential. And it's, it's, it's just a, it's a miracle. I, 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 everybody will agree that, that they were able to do that, okay? And, and uh, so that is how they demonstrated, that's how, how they got the Nobel Prize. They were able to demonstrate through this painstaking uh, calculation that you indeed can have action potential not only generate but pro propagate along the axon, okay? And, uh, but then there was some, some, some deficiency in the sense that people, uh, especially Haskin and Cole begin to measure, uh, they put electron in there and measure the small signal impedances. And, and they use this uh, Wisdom Bridge, which is a very accurate instrument to calculate the, the, the real part of an impedance. And they were shocked to find that the real part is positive, which means that it's inductant, okay? So at low frequency, they, uh, they were shocked, uh, Huskin and, and Cole and, and, and all the luminaries, but they found that, that, uh, that, that at low frequency, the potassium channel behaves like an, an inductance. And, uh, so they they independent and, and they if I also found that they, they behave the 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 <coughs> the, the uh, action behave like rectifying diodes and I already mentioned that in the first lecture I'm just repeating this to remind that that this is a, a big deal then and particular call as I wrote a book and and, and in one of the pages I quote this the suggestion of an inductive reactance anywhere in the system was shocking to the point of being unbelievable. This comes from a very eminent physiologist to study how, how uh, serious that dilemma was, okay? And, and so there was just a cartoon by Dr. Smitnep showing that, uh, that, 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 that this was remained unsolved today, for example. People, and of course, people stopped looking for the diodes and, and, and inductors. And, but people didn't realize that there was a person that I called an unsung hero, Otto Smith. Because in spite of, and how many of you have heard of the Smith trigger? If you were, well, most of you, well, 
That's Horace Smith. He was a fantastic uh, uh, scientist. So in spite of the name inductance, which Haskin and Cole, that's the problem. They called them inductance. And that was what messed up everything, OK? Uh, so in spite of the name inductance, which Haskin called and other luminaries had given to the actions positive reactance, only Otto Smith had resisted and objected actually strongly to the use of the term inductance. He believed that there is some fundamental conceptual error. He was right on. And that some yet unidentified circuit that might resolve the paradox. And that unidentified is exactly the memory store. So, so I call him the unsung hero. Okay? So Haskin has struggled in vain searching for the physical interpretation of the squid action inductance. You know, he failed because, because there isn't any, okay? He had mistaken action for a time-varying conductance, where in fact, it has a simple explanation if the potassium and sodium ion channels are identified as memory stores, okay? So in fact, I have a th theorem below which says that every time-varying resistance, which cannot be specified by an explicit function of time, but must be derived from the current I of T or the voltage V of T of some internal state variable is a memory store. That's what, so anytime you have a time varying, time varying system that you don't have a, a, a explicit uh, time variation, you have a memory store, okay? And so the correct model today is, is that it's the same model, the, no change in the equation, it's just the correct identification of what that element is. Okay, and all right. Now, uh, and now uh, we, for after extracting this, you will see that, uh, that the, the potassium has one state variable, and, and you have seen that already, but I just show you why it's a memory store. And it, and it has the signature of a memory store because it has all the spin hysteresis loop. And at high frequencies, it re reduces to straight lines, and, but the slope changes with the amplitude. So these are all the signatures, uh, all, the, all the fingerprints of a memory store. So, so it is a memory store. And then, uh, and then the signature is, if you don't have a periodic signal, you have to have zero crossing, identical zero crossing. And there you are. So there's no question, in other words, that Haskin Haskin device is a, is a memory store. It's a first order memory store. And with that, it makes sense to talk about DC curve. You can actually calculate them. And this would have been that what you would measure from, from Wisdom Bridge in the old days. So this is the DCVI curve of a, of a potassium ion channel. And once you realize the memory store, this becomes trivial. To, and likewise, for the sodium memory store, you extract from the original Haskin Huxley equation, there are two differential equations. Remember, there were four. We took away one of them, there are two more. And again, you have pinch hysteresis loop the correct fingerprint. At high frequency, you got different straight lines, the fingerprint again, and the, when it's not periodic, it ha has the zero, same zero crossing, it has the signature. So sodium, ion channel is a memory cell as well. And once you know that, you can calculate easily the DCV, and that's what it looks like, okay? And, and uh, so, but by the way, once you have the DCV curve, uh, then you can uh, uh, zoom in and go to any point you wish, like the potassium one, and say, what's the small signal model? And, it, and everything has been derived and published already, by the way, in, uh, in, in our papers. Uh, that was referenced uh, two weeks ago. And you can have an exact small signal model up to the, even calculate all the numbers. And a different operating point is always the same small signal model, just different number, and all of this, it's just, uh, just crying it out. It's, it's, so it's no longer a mystery. And likewise, for the sodium, same thing. It turn, in, see, in the potassium, it's first of all, you have one inductor. The sodium, you have two inductors, okay? But the equations are given to calculate all of them. And <coughs> so this is the corresponding, the upper one is the original Haskins Huxley, the lower one is the correct version of the, uh, the membrane-based uh, Haskins Huxley model. But it's, the same Haskin Huxley model. Now you can ask, what is the DCV icon of the whole thing? Remember uh, this diode rectifier thing? So you just throw away the capacitor, and since all the elements now have equations, it's trivial to calculate them, or you can do this graphically, which I demonstrated there. And if you look at the paper, you see that uh, this is all trivial. And you see that curve, and because of the, uh, of, of the reference direction, you should rotate it, that curve 180 degrees, 
to, and you see it's the same as what Haskell and Huxley have seen that they call the rectifier, that they call anomalous. So all the mystery has now been completely resolved, okay? And moreover, the important thing is now that we have a model, we, have the, we, have, we know that they were in Bristol, we have the equivalent circuit, we can now actually calculate the explicit small signal admittance or impedance. The question is given below. In particular, we are interested in the real part. The upper part by we have the impedance, but it is more convenient to calculate the, the, the admittance because they're all in parallel. So, so, so we now have the expression of the admittance, and that's what's important because that's going to go to resolve a mystery. This is the Nyquist plot, and if you look at upper part, you will see that the reactance is positive, and, and, and at about point, at about 50 hertz, 53 hertz, that's the frequency actually that Huskin measured, about 0.2 Henry, it, it measured 0.2 Henry. And this is what, it, what I magnified. At that point on the left side, you, you would have measured at 53 hertz, about 0.2 Henry, exactly what Huskin and Cole had measured with the Wilson Bridge and, and published and didn't know where it came from. So this is a picture of showing that the, the small signal circuit of the Huskin Huxley model at three different DC operating points. You can see that all the numbers are there, and they're all trivial because all the equations are now available and they're exact. So that's why I say that, that we can now solve the entropy problem. Uh, in spite of the fact that Huskin equation is wonderful, and you can use it for simulation and get the, get the correct pre prediction, but no one even today, no one knows exactly what's the mechanism, especially what is the mathematical mechanism that led to this none, all or none behavior. And because this is something quite, quite deep mathematically, but there is an answer, and we now know the answer. And as, in order to solve that, to have this correct answer, you have to go back to look at this Husky and Huxley equation, which as I'm repeating here, and I want to show, look at that again, how messy it is. It is four differential equations, very nonlinear. But to solve this problem, you have to find the Jacobian matrix. The Jacobian matrix is a four by four matrix, which are obtained by the partial derivatives of each variable with respect to the, all the others. And you, so you have 16 very messy equations that is so messy that nobody dare do. And that's Jacobian matrix. It's a four by four matrix that is so messy that, that uh, nobody had attempted. But to understand the complex bifurcation phenomena exhibited by the Husky and Huxley equation, we must calculate the four eigenvalues of this Jacobian matrix. That matrix on the right, you have to calculate the Jacobian matrix. No one has, uh, uh, well, there was some calculating numerically, that's already a major work, but no one has been able to examine it analytically, see where they come from, okay? So because, that's because dimension four is just too large for analysis. The Huskins Huxley equation have so far been studied only in numerical in integration. No analytical have been proved to date. Our analysis via the scalar admittance function, remember I told you that you can have a single admitter, which is a scalar, is a function of a complex variable S. It's the first rigorous analysis of SS equation without involving any approximations. So this is the main theorem. The, you know, we published a paper that was 45 pages long, but the main equation is this theorem. It says that the eigenvalues of the Husky and Huxley 4x4 four four matrix are identical to the zeros of the scalar admittance function, which is just this fourth order polynomial. Look at how much complexity is resolved. We, instead of calculating this 4x4 four four matrix, you need to only look at one scalar equation. Just look for the roots. And that, there are four rules because four, four for the polynomial, and those four rules are exactly the eigenvalue. This is the main result, and I, I consider this is now the foundation. Okay, so that is the the, the uh, admittance matrix given there, and now even though I haven't defined edge of chaos here, we keep talking about it. You have to unfortunately wait till toward the end where we're going to go back to edge. But today, you can there's a theorem that will be stated there. But you can take the theorem as a definition today, so there's no big deal. So the theorem says that you are on the edge of chaos if two conditions are satisfied. Number one, all the zeros of the admittance must be on the left half plane. That means that, that you look at the fourth order po uh, scalar polynomial, you calculate the roots, and all the roots must have negative real part. That's the first condition. 
Second condition is that you look at the real part of the admittance, and we have both of them. We have the analytic expression. So you calculate real part, and it has to be negative for at least some frequency. You can take this too as a definition today. So you, say, you don't have to say, I don't know, A sub K, why do you sell it? Well, make these two conditions as a definition. If you, if you have a one port that has this condition, you, have, you are on the edge of chaos, okay? And so now with that, we can calculate. And now the edge of chaos is actually testable. It involves only linear algebra. And, and the reason this is so important is because I, can, I proved the action potential is impossible without edge of chaos. And that, uh, it's, uh, that implies that life, of course, is impossible without edge of chaos. And with this, Simple definition, I mean, uh, two conditions, or you can call them definition now. You can calculate exactly uh, where are the location of the zeros. And then uh, forget about all the detail, except that they, you, you look at the upper right uh, picture, I mean, uh, box. You see that when the membrane potential is at minus 5.34 millivolt, the eigenvalue is exactly at the, at the vertical axis. In other words, you, you H of K has got to be to the left of that because it has to be on the left up plane. So we were able to calculate that. And uh, this is the second condition. You have to plot the real part of the admittance. And anything that below this, the, 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 the plane is negative, right? And you want to see if there are any. If you look carefully, there are some uh, uh, two islands. Is that so clear? Maybe the next one is better. Yeah, you can see two white islands. Anything below that is, is negative. And so you have the second condition. And so we have shown that the range of edge of chaos of the Haskins Huxley equation is within that range. The, the, the current, we look at the Haskins Huxley model now, you have two wires coming in, okay, with, with, with all this thing and enclosed by box. The current should be between that range, which is in a very small interval, 1.94 microampere. Or, or equivalent, the voltage across that axon, the Haskin Hackley model, should be between those ranges and it's only about 0.74 millivolt. This is incredible. Remember, this is calculated from my equations, the edge of chaos. I was shocked myself to see the accuracy that we, we got here, you know? And this is what I call the Goldilocks zone for action potential. By the way, for all those folks tuning in from Europe or elsewhere that never heard of Goldilocks, uh, look up the uh, <coughs> Wikipedia, and you see the, the children's story. But now, this is now a very scientific term. It's called the Goldilocks zone. You know, anything like people are looking for life in the, in, in the exoplanet, and they were saying that uh, the Goldilocks zone, uh, you know, is a very small zone where life is possible. And this is what the word Goldilocks zone means. So the Goldilocks zone here means that it got to be almost exactly uh, uh, to, to within a, 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 des a few depths of a point uh, for something to work. And the window of life to be possible is that you have the Goldilocks zone is about uh, less than two microampere or the voltage of one millivolt. And, and this is derived exactly from my theory. Okay. So also, if you, those of you who read books about uh, neurobiology, we always read about this. People would like to call excitability. He said this, the membrane is excitable, uh, the action is excitable. What I mean is, is, is loosely means that it's possible to generate action potential. But nobody really ever defined what excitability means. It's, it's just an intuition. But now the fuzzy concept of an excitable media, whether it's an axon or a dendrite or muscle or tissue, is precisely the existence of an edge of chaos domain in the media cell. So this is why I'm putting so much stress in edge of chaos, because this is truly a deep fundamental concept that if there's one thing you want to learn from this course is the edge of chaos. Okay? So now, uh, of course, uh, all of, you can generate something for nothing, especially from from, from 70 millivolt to 110 millivolt swing, you got to pay for that, right? That is, is, and of course, uh, that, uh, there is a mechanism, it's called a sodium potassium pump. And then, and that's, there is a pump, a chemical pump. But what powers a pump? Where's the battery? Well, there's a chemical battery called the ATP. So all of this is going to be come back toward the end when we talk about local activity. You have to pay for the activity. And, and we pay for it, of course, in circuit by, just by battery. So all of this is now understood precisely if you understand local activity and you understand edge of chaos. 
Now, it turns out, and uh, one of uh, you folks asked actually a question in the first lecture about Haskins Huckley for, for, uh, for, 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 for the heartbeat. It turns out that, that, that the heartbeat, now, by the way, if you look at this uh, heart on top, this, you have this vein, that, this vagus, this thing that, that, that bobs up, those are exactly the vagus vein that uh, Lowy used to pump electricity to, to prove that the, that, that the synapse actually has a gap, okay? So that's the vagus gap, yeah? And it turned out that all, all of these veins and uh, 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 fibers that touches the heart uh, is, is make, it ex make it excitable, and, and it obeys exactly the same equation as Huskin Huxley. It's just that the parameters are different, okay? And so, uh, the, the, and it makes contact. This is the equivalent of, 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 of the synapse. It just makes contact on the master, the heart master. And, and, and under the right threshold, the, uh, the, 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 you will get this. This is the heart bit, okay? So everything is the same, and we, we have, except that the parameters are different. Therefore, uh, uh, this is the, the same Huskin and Huxley equation, except that there's some different parameters, except that in two parameters, A and B, you know, that have been introduced, A and B are essentially two batteries if you interpret it properly. And this will be the key parameter in my next slide here because it, we're going to tune A and B and see what happened, okay? And, and uh, uh, so this is now the Huskin Huxley model for the heart or cardiac. Your heart and my heart obeys this equation basically. And these are the parameters. And, and it's, you have the same potassium channel and sodium channel, just different parameters, okay? Now it turns out that there is, you see there's a, the red, the red the little thing in the bottom and the bottom are the edge of chaos. And this is calculated from my theory. But we, we zoom in now at one point where how bit, well you how bit might have are normal, which means about 65 bits per minute, okay? So I'm gonna blow that up, that both sides there, and we're sitting now right on the edge of chaos. That's zero. When A is 41.25 and B is 100.5, most of you are in, within that range, and this is the heartbeat. It's irregular. It's about 63 bits per minute, perfectly normal. Now, I'm going to perturb the B parameter just by, by so much, by 0.6. So it becomes from 100.5 to 101.6, okay? That. Look what happened. The heartbeat stops beating. That's amazing, isn't it? it, it, it uh, the, we, we are all living in this very tiny Goldilocks zone, okay? The Goldilocks zone for normal beating heart is it's less than 1%. It's, it's truly amazing that, that we're still alive, you know, that, that we, we stay close to that 1% thing. And I'm gonna come back, I'm gonna come back to later on when we talk about complexity to address this issue, you know, okay? Now, it turns out that not only our axon, the brain, the nerves, but and not only the heart, but also muscles. You know, when you contract you know, a muscle, it's the same thing. You got, you got, you got this, uh, this uh, synapse that, that touches, uh, uh, there's a gap, of course, with, with a muscle. And, 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 and they have different channels. There's potassium channel, there's sodium channel. I said they're all membranes now. Okay, this is which I'm showing you already, is that they're all membranes. And they're calcium. In, in the muscle, in particular, calcium channel is very important. And then there is a chloride. Remember, chloride, and we, I'm gonna come back to chloride later. It's also very important. And finally, there is acetylcholine. When, when you recall earlier, I talked about this uh, dream of uh, Otto Louis, you know, the, and, and uh, that, that there is something, there was got to be some molecule that go through this little tunnel, right, to, 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 uh, to change the, the period of the heart. That chemical, is the, neuro, this is the neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. So, so this is all now tied together. Okay. All right. Uh, so I can now summarize by saying that because all ion channels, the voltage-gated ion channels are membrane stores, so without ion channel membrane stores, all muscle is going to freeze, would freeze. Without ion channel membrane stores, our heart would start beating. Without ion channel memory, so there will be no action potential and we would all be brain dead zombies, okay? So one cannot breathe, move, or think without memory. So it's essentially what, this is, uh, what I'm telling you about, okay? Uh, now, the question now is, uh, and this is a remarkable thing about Huskin and Huxley, uh, they, 
just because of their, their great scientists, they were able to postulate that there must be uh, ch channels where the sodium can come in or leave and potassium come in and leave, as well as a few of the other ones like acetylcholine or chloride. But those were minority as far as the action is concerned. So, we, so they focused only correctly on the sodium and potassium. But no one, until 1964, no one knows whether the potassium and sodium ion channel that were postulated by asking are fictitious or they were real, even though they got the Nobel Prize, okay? Well, it turned out that the answer is the magic bullet proof, I call. You know, the magic bullet, which proved that the potassium ion channel and the sodium ion channel are real, comes from Fugu. How many of you know Fugu? I've heard of Fugu. Well, great. You know, uh, so those of you who didn't know this is Fugu, it's a pretty fish, except that when it uh, gets uh, uh, disturbed, you know, it would, it would blow up. That's why it's called a puffer fish. It, it, you know, this is what, this is, this is called a Fugu in Japan. And, and it's a culinary, you know. Uh, it's a very expensive delicacy offered only in high-end gourmet restaurants in Japan. You know, I, I certainly cannot, I would not pay for it, but I had a good fortune that one of my colleagues uh, about three years ago invited me. And so I said, I'm going to give you a treat. And, and the treat is the fugu. So I was very happy, uh, you know, and happy until I realized later on that uh, that it is deadly because a small organ of the puffer fish contains a toxic molecule called tetrodoxin, which is a thousand times as powerful as the cyanide. And that is because uh, the ovary of the fugu contains a deadly poison molecule which plucks the pole of the ion channels. It, it's just a perfect fit, okay? And, and, and uh, so, so that's the proof of that the, there are ion channels, you know, is, is through, this, through this fugu. By the way, uh, this is a great delicacy, and, and of course, all of you would like to be emperor, except that if you are emperor, like the Japanese emperor, and his families are prohibited by law eating to, from eating the supreme Japanese delicate fugu. It's against the law. They alone cannot have fugu, okay? Okay, now, uh, that the, so, so we now know what blocks the sodium channel. Question now is, what blocks the potassium channel? You know, I mean, nowadays people routinely make experiments. So they want to look at the sodium channel, they pluck the potassium. If they want to find the potassium, they pluck the sodium channel. Through, through poison. The reason why poison is, is important is because precisely you die because, because you can't breathe, right, or whatever. And it's because you, you got plucked. It turns out that if you want to find the potassium, you pluck you add the sodium, you pluck the potassium. And you pluck it with a scorpion. And so the, the scorpion, Sada, is turned out to be the real hero here. It's just like the Fugu, except this one now plucked the potassium channel. And, and this led to a beautiful paper in the cover of Nature in um, May 1st of 2003. And the writer uh, is our hero today, Roderick McKinnon. Uh, he was just a very young, young man from Harvard. And he already had tenure. At, at Harvard, and he quit just because he had the insight that, that of how to uh, find the, the the molecular structure. You see, to understand how this works, uh, how all these things, you have to know the molecular structure. And and through his a very good insight, he was able to publish this paper, and he used the the uh, scorpion potion to do it. Okay, and it's essentially the potassium channel is essentially made up of uh, four pieces of identical proteins that we don't need to go into details. And the molecular structure is, looks like that. And in a, this is, the opening center is, is a hole, and that's called a pore. And now that uh, this is the beautiful picture that led to the Nobel Prize. What you see in the center is a potassium ion, OK? This is actually quite big, by the way. And, and by the way, the, it, interesting enough, sodium, for those of you who knew something about chemistry, Sodium is actually smaller, quite a bit smaller than the potassium. This is a potassium uh, ion channel. Sodium is much smaller. And yet, no, pot, no sodium is going through there. It's got a bigger hole. And, and, and so there's a very complicated chemistry and, and, and physics, you know, and electrical engineering going on in there, and it's now well understood. And so, so, so McKinnon didn't get an over, just found the stuff, but he they were able to explain why that is so, okay? So this picture, as I say, is really worth the Nobel Prize. And one of the mechanisms, I don't have to go through that, but it's a beautiful story. 
It's, it's, it's just a fantastic how nature evolved to be able to get this beautiful machinery of the potassium ion channel. And in fact, after he got the Nobel Prize, McKinnon actually commissioned a famous artist, Julian Voss, and, and that was the, about a, a meter and a half a sculpture, and that is patterned almost exactly as the potassium channel. This has been, by the way, exhibited during an expression exhibition in the London Tate Gallery. So, so, so it has to be a, a really quality uh, art piece. Okay, so uh, talking more about uh, ions and ion channel. Excitation and electrical signaling in the brain involve the movement of ions through ion channels. The sodium, potassium, calcium, and chloride ions are responsible for almost all of the transport dynamics in our life, okay? And, and they all involve ion channels. By the ion channels basically are just water-filled uh, biological nanotubes, sub-nanotubes. They're very small, you know, that, and they're formed by large pro protein molecules. And ion flows through an ion channel is simply current flowing through a memristor. So, so it's, it's important for biology to realize now, that, realize now that there is a way of correctly thinking how all these ions work yeah, through the voltage-gated channel, and they're all, all just going through membranes. And so because voltage-gated ion channels can modulate and change their conductances depending on the history of their membrane potential, and that's the problem. You have to have the history. That's why you need membranes. Whereas when Huck and Huck, they were all thinking about this time varying thing, they, they forget about there is a history. And if you don't realize that you need to have the history, you always on the wrong track. That's why for more than 60 years, there was no progress. I think it's now time to get on to the right track. Okay. So voltage-gated ion channels are membranes. Okay. And uh, by the way, uh, uh, ion channels are I like bridges, you know. An ion channel across a membrane is like a bridge across a A gated ion channel across a membrane is just like a gated channel which can be opened or crossed by, you know, by a drawbridge. And the ion channel, you have seen the picture, you know, it's, it's, it's just like a wine barrel, you know, made up of steps, and, and you have four or five steps. And not only, I, not, not only uh, the, the synapses, but also the receptors of neurotransmitters, because the thing that, that, that go through uh, the synapses are, 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 are chemical. Those chemicals are called neurotransmitters. And, and we're going to talk a bit about neurotransmitters shortly, okay? So, so gated ion channels can be opened or closed by either sensing the voltage potential or by binding a particular neurotransmitter into a channeled socket through what's called a, a key and lock mechanism. Those of you who are not chemists, all you need to know is that they are setting this neurotransmitter, you know, when they lock on into a, one of those receptor codes for that particular neurotransmitter, for that particular molecule, it's going to cause the, the, the structure to, to, to the, the pole to open so that the ions can go through. And, and the reason, by the way, you may question why, why would nature evolve, uh, you know, with this complicated mechanism, why go through the, all this chemistry, why not just all electricity? And the reason is very simple. It turned out that the, uh, the, 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 uh, this fluid in, that involve a very, very high impedance. So if you just use an electrical, you have a 110 millivolt thing. By the time you go a few uh, millimeters, you're down to maybe say five, five millivolt. It, it, it's just too much loss of a voltage drop. You will never be able to transmit signal. That's why you have to go through this chemistry, okay? And so this is a voltage gate channel. When a voltage is, uh, so when you have enough, enough uh, uh, threshold, etc., then the pole is going to open like on the right, and the, the ion of the right type will go through. Okay? Now, so I now say that, uh, that the, uh, what, the, the cliche here is we all know that where there is smoke, there is fire. Now I say where there is ion, there is membrane. Okay? That's, that's as simple as that. Okay? Because ion is electricity, right? And if you have anything to operate with ion, you have a membrane. Okay? All right, now let's talk about some of the major, there are many, many neurotransmitters, you know, but what's important, by, I'm, I'm now leading to next week's lecture, where I'm gonna talk about CNN, and you will see that we are gonna be able to imitate, you know, uh, neurotransmitters, and it has to, some neurotransmitters by the way, are excitatory, meaning the more, the, the quicker you build toward the threshold. But there are all certain class of neurotransmitters, certain kind of molecules that would inhibit 
You know, he said, not so fast. You know, you got to do it gently. It turned out you need a balance. Remember that because next week we're going to talk about exactly the, the real circuit that would think and do things like certain kind of brain that you actually need to balance out the excitatory inhibitory. That's why I'm taking time here to talk about neurotransmitter. You know, even though I'm not a chemist, you know, Dr. Dr. Williams is, but, but for the little I know, uh, it's important for you to understand that, that uh, when, when I talk next week about templates, positive coefficient, negative coefficient, you should associate with excitatory neurotransmitter or inhibitory neurotransmitter. Okay, the most important um, um, uh, of, the, of the family of neurotransmitters is called glutamate, and that's the, uh, the chemical symbol. Uh, those of you who didn't know about glutamate, but you certainly have come across it, because anyone who went to a Chinese restaurant that tastes a good taste of Chinese food, where they use monosodium glutamate, that's, that's glutamate, okay? So at least you have experience what that is. Glutamate is the key neurotransmitter. It's excitatory, okay? That's why it makes you taste better. It, you know, it's responsible for the LTP memory, okay? Uh, let me go forward. And essentially, it binds to a receptor and then opens up for ions to go through. The next one, also excitatory. It turns out that this acetylcholine can be excitatory or inhibitory depending on where it is. Okay, and so this is a, a, a very interesting uh, molecule. The one that Otto Louis go through with the frog uh, is an excitatory, uh, an inhibitory one. Okay, so acetylcholine actually acts like glutamate by opening ion channel and let sodium and potassium uh, out. So this would be an excitatory version. Then there is the GABA, uh, which is just a short for the, the, the long name below it, and that is inhibitory. And uh, without going through the detail, there's a glycine, which is also inhibitory. That, this is just the most important one that I just point out. And the reason they have so many different chemical neurotransmitters is the same reason why we have different templates in next week uh, for the same reason. Okay. By the way, uh, when a glycine molecule binds, to a receptor, it acts like GABA by making the membrane to become more negative within a few milliseconds, thereby inhibiting the firing of spikes. So it's an inhib inhibitor, okay? By the way, uh, the poison strychnine, which figures prominently in mystery novels, those of you who've seen mystery novels or seen movies about um, uh, the mysteries would always heal about strychnine. Okay? Essentially, they block the Greek glycine uh, receptor and prevents their activation. And there's an important one called dopamine. And the dopamine is very interesting because it's only re within recent history that people knew it's a neurotransmitter. By the way, the word dope it's come from dopamine. Okay? And this is, uh, Albert Kitson got a Nobel Prize for insisting, nobody believes him, but he had to go for a lot of work to prove that dopamine is a neurotransmitter. And for that, he got the Nobel Prize, okay? And by the way, dopamine uh, is an interesting neurotransmitter. And like all the other, this is a pleasure neurotransmitter. You know, when you're happy, you essentially, your dopamine is level is increased. Dopamine is basically a molecule of emotion. It's also the, if you, the, the lack of dopamine is what, makes you into depression. In, in a lot of psycho cases, it's because of lack of dopamine and others, similar neurotransmitters like serotonin and other things. They're all of the same class. So in fact, when you are in love, your dopamine level essentially shoots up. Uh, we now know that because of Arvid Carson. Okay? In the same way, coffee, caffeine, would blocks the inhibiting action of adenosine resulting in overstimulation of excitatory neurotransmitter by leading to stimulation, alertness, and the elevation of mood. Now, this is a bit of a lot of chemistry, but I'm saying this because beginning next week, we're going to talk about real circuits that will emulate this kind of actions, okay? And we're going to have templates. So when you hear of templates, you should relate to neurotransmitters, okay? Ion channels are in fact therefore perfect molecular sensor because only a particular receptor will allow a certain molecule to go through. Like I said, the, the potassium ion channel is, is so big that sodium could have easily gone through because it's much smaller and it doesn't. So it's, that's why they are sensors, okay? 
Now, uh, interestingly enough, I, and now I had a, a, a little bit of a, a timeline here. Uh, it turned out that, that Memrisho had existed. The last I told you, the first man-made Memrisho was by Sir Humphrey Davy in 1801. I've already told you that two, two lectures ago. But it turned out that Memrisho is now known to exist at least 500 million years ago because of fossil record. There were fossil record found in 2007 that showed that at least for 500 million years there were jellyfish. And jellyfish would not exist without ion channels because you need to have this action potential to, to, to trigger this proportion mechanism. So this is the timeline of Memrisho. At the center in 1970, which where I published a paper without presenting evidence, until 2008, where Stan William and his group, the green one, came up with the first real nano Memrisho, the real Memrisho. And then, but we now know that you go back to 1801, they were the first man-made memory. They were not nano, they were these huge spark electrodes, uh, you know, that needed a thousand volts to generate a spark. But that was the first man-made memory store. And then we don't know yet what's to come. You know, this was prepared in 2000, you know, uh, just last year. And, and there'll be many more, I'm sure. But then we now know that at 500 million years ago, jellyfish was there. So, the, so it's as old as that. It's nature's, it's nature's memory store. So that's the timeline. Okay. Now, inter interestingly enough, Using memoristo fingerprint to diagnose, we can use mem we know that memory have fingerprint, right? We can use memoristo fingerprint to diagnose many kinds of ion channel diseases. Because ion channels are memoristos, healthy and diseased ion channels have different memoristo fingerprints and can therefore be diagnosed via automated digital lookup table. You know, so is, someday people are gonna, we're gonna have a table of if you have uh, epilepsy, you're gonna have a table of what are the, the kind of fingerprint you should have. If you have myotonia, uh, so most of you don't know what myotonia is, but I'll come back to it in a second. Mig you have migraine headache, or certain type of diabetes, all of these are is a problem because of defects in the ion channel. And those defects is gonna come up with in the uh, by looking at the pitch history this loop, uh, the loss because it will have a certain signature that will be defective. So I, so I believe that this has a future as in that as well. But myotonia is interesting. Uh, it, uh, here, uh, let me just repeat. Every voltage jet ion channel is a memory so identified by unique set of pinch history this loop, uh, including disease ion channels. And therefore, a digital lookup table can be compiled for automated diagnostic purposes. This is the future. I, I believe this is going to come. Now, it's interesting. How many of you have heard story about the fainting goats? Oh, great. It turned out that there is a breed of goats that was uh, first discovered in the 18th century in Tennessee. And those goats were very unique in that they're very shy. And in the, if you just shout at something, some strange noise, they would just freeze. You know, the, you know, you know, the muscle uh, uh, can contract units action potential, but they will freeze. There is no action potential. So we stiff and they fall down. See that? Uh, I actually have a video that I was prepared and then our camera crews will say that I need permission from Google. So, but uh, we, we will, uh, all you need is just look at, uh, go home and look at that. You see the real motion picture that uh, this, this poor, a nice uh, goats would suddenly just, just uh, they were running, walking, and suddenly would just fall down. And we wait about 20 minutes, 20 seconds, 50 seconds, and they would come up again, and they would just walk like normal. A bit like certain kind of epileptic thing. You know, you 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 just just unconscious, and then you get up, okay? And and by the way, this there's a, bit, a true story that about this myotonia, and this is back in Tennessee in the old days when it was first discovered. There was a a landholder that had uh, a flock of sheep. And during one of those uh, Christmas events, so he called one of his servants, you know, and say, uh, they're, they're gonna have a barbecue. So he say, uh, John, come on here, give him a shotgun. Say, go, go out and hit, and, and get, kill one of those uh, uh, fatty uh, sheep there, and we're gonna have barbecue. So this, uh, uh, this high hand went out there, carefully looked for a, a, a fat one, shoot, and then all of a sudden, 50 of them all fall down. 
So he was okay. He ran right back. He didn't wait for 20 seconds. He would have seen that he come out again, okay? He went back and said, um, I don't know what happened. I only find one shape, but they, uh, all damn goats all just fell down, you know? <laughs> that was myotonia, okay? That was the first observation of myotonia. And look at this video, okay? All right. Uh, turn out that now we know that the reason for that, well, there was a single, there was a corolla. Remember I told you there were iron channels. The potassium and sodium are the important ones, but there's acetylcholine, there is calcium, there's also chloride. It turned out that if you have a deficiency of chloride, uh, at least for those shapes, uh, you, or, um, they, but the human also, by the way, there's such a disease called myotonia congenita that have the same problem. Okay? So this is the, the end of the talk, and then I'm going to go on to uh, the next week, by the way, the reader is, uh, how does the mathematician catch a rabbit? Everywhere I give you a reader. Okay, that's next week's reader. And lecture six is going to be CNN, Cellular Nonlinear Networks. And this is the, you can all tune up, these are the pre warm up reads. Okay, and now the, the quote for the day is the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscape, but in having new eyes by Marcel Proust. This is going to be my hero and our hero. After the break, we're going to have the discussion. We're going to come back to Marcel Proust. Thank you very much. OK, while, while, while we're waiting, I want to announce that uh, Dr. Yen Xing Shu, who is in the audience, can, can I have uh, him sign up there, is the winner for this week's uh, prize. And I would like to uh, uh, just briefly introduce Dr. Shi. Sue was with, uh, from Taiwan and uh, a physicist, uh, presently working with Solid Millipass, and I'm very pleased to, uh, the solution was given in that slide, that you can read that. He has correctly solved the problem. There were three entries, uh, he, was, he got the correct solution. So, uh, Dr. Sue, can you come over here? Watch your step. There's the thing, okay. Congratulations. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Bye. Okay. All right. So, so as usual, we should have questions first. You know, I I always prepare something else just so, just so that if there are enough questions, I have something to entertain you with. Okay. So, questions. So, uh, Liam. Uh, uh, so, Liam, you you essentially uh, compared the. The ion channel to a to a bridge, but but I, I tend to think of it more as a valve. Uh, Even the ion channel. Ion channel, yeah. yes. That. Uh, yeah, this this is a very r r rough mm -hmm. intuition. It's that, not quite uh, correct. That that they're that they're able to open and close, uh, uh, and 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 thereby allow ions to flow in and out. Have Have you thought about the the difference between sodium and potassium? in terms of the fact that one is essentially a first order and the other is a second order? I mean, does that issue of the second order uh, uh, or, or, you know, uh, well, well, behavior oh, of, yeah, yeah. of... Absolutely, absolutely, because they are, now that you know that they are memory stores and you have the equation, potassium channel is first order. So it means that you, uh, potassium ion channel is not really, uh, doesn't have enough, it's not endowed with enough dynamics to make things interesting. Whereas uh, sodium is second order. And most of you now know, and in my first lecture, I show you that if you want to build an oscillator, something that oscillate, you need two differentiate, well, not just one. So, so if you just have a single potassium, I, and you put a battery, it's not going to do anything. If you have a sodium, you put in a battery, you can actually make it oscillate. And I, we have shown that. Except that in the case of sodium channel, the oscillation is unstable. So that you can momentarily seize it, but it will decay. But from perspective of nonlinear dynamic, that's an oscillation. It's, it's the fact that it's not stable is, is, is another question, okay? So you can have oscillation, in other words. And, and, and so that's one fundamental difference. Uh, from, I believe that once biologists begin to understand 
that, that everything has to do with dynamics, and that, that they have to, to, to confront iron cyanide as membranes. They begin to understand, to develop the real physiological mechanism. No one knows, really, the physiology of this, you know. All I'm saying here is that we now know that they are membranes, and you should call a spade a spade, and, and, and then that's where the, the future progress will be. And it's not surprising, like I say, Bernstein, you know, well, it was a theory that of, of the ion channel, which involves only one potassium, only potassium channel, nothing else. Everybody knew it was wrong, but it was taught for 50 years. For 50, it was, it was in textbook. Everybody learned that until Haskin Huxley came around. And now, of course, it's all in a textbook now. And I believe that, that years from now, textbook is going to be changed and going to start an entirely different way of physiology, understanding the physiology of this actual potential. Hopefully, did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Hi, um, I was stimulated Could you identify by- yourself, Oh, please? I'm Warren Jackson. Um, I was stimulated by your, that problem, and you had a thing called- You're talking about this problem. Here. Yeah, you had something called Pfaff's equation, and so I looked it up and I found out that it's a formalism that is was after Lagrange but before um, Hamiltonian, and it's Would actually. Would you mind pick, speak a little loud, louder? Okay, I'll because take I have a little bit of hearing problem. Um, you mean louder or? Yeah, something? a little louder. Please. Oh, louder. I okay. Have hearing, um, hearing problem. So, the FAF approach is supposedly way more general than Hamiltonian or Lagrangian, and people do thermodynamics and generalize thermodynamics with it. I wondered if you had used um, that Pfaff equation to advance memristors, um, because that formalism seems very useful for nonlinear and, and things okay. like that. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I understand exactly the equation, but I realized that, that you, uh, you're probably a physicist and asking the right question. And um, most physicists, or in any textbook, you see that that they would teach you for Lagrangian, and they would take you, teach you that for when, when, the, when Lagrangian basically it has to be lossless, you know, and then from that class you can have write Hamiltonian equation. And that's where the word Hamiltonian come from. So so it 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 almost it follows that everybody believes. Uh, when I say every, I mean most physicists believe that uh, only uh, lossless physical system would have a Hamiltonian. And I, in fact, once believed that as well. This is why I was quite shocked when Ito uh, uh, from, from Japan, and he's actually tuning in today, actually first alerted to me that, that uh, you could have Hamiltonian using memory. So I, and I first, I didn't believe him, okay? And sure enough, we, we, we have, because we have the equation, everything is proof. And, and, and so, they, so this is a counter example, which shows that, that uh, when you have lost a system, you, it implies you have Hamiltonian, but not vice versa. And, and we, we, if you dig deeper into mathematics, it will turn out that some old mathematician of the th previous uh, century, uh, a certain German mathematician by the name of Pfaff, P-F-A-F-F, -F -F, I don't know how to pronounce that, P I call it Pfaff, okay, uh, actually had a system of equation that is basically a generalized Hamiltonian. And he was, he actually, well, he didn't quite produce, he didn't produce Hamiltonian because he didn't know anything, he's a physicist, okay? But he had a Hamiltonian equation that looked like Hamiltonian, except that he had some extra term on the left-hand side. And, and those extra term is the one that I, that I normalized, on ether and I normalized to get into the, the, a, a true Hamiltonian equation. Because his equation is not true Hamiltonian because he had this extra term. And, and so, so I guess the morale of this research, and I'm glad I put this up you know, for this prize because I learned something new. And, and that we, we essentially now know that it's not, it, it's, it doesn't involve a new principle here. It's really the conservation of flux. But what's interesting is that, that it, 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 it was camouflaged so much that if you look at the Hamiltonian equation or, or the Hamiltonian, you cannot say that they are, that it is they are. You cannot identify individual terms that are called pseudo kinetic and pseudo potential. And say that aha, that's that's uh, uh, flux. And that's by the way what 
uh, Stan William discovered in the, when he won the first prize, first prize, because it was so simple, you could actually see that they were flux, but not in the second example. And it was uh, Dr. Seuss uh, in uh, sort of insight. Not only he found that they were flux, but he actually generalized it to even a little bit beyond the equation. He, he actually proved it for a more general class of, of uh, generic memory stores. Okay? So, so the, the lesson we learned here is that uh, the, uh, a lot bigger class, a lot bigger class of non uh, uh, conservative, I mean, of, of, of this dissipative system, system that dissipate, you know, power instead of, of, of store, to store energy, dissipate energy, actually have Hamiltonian equation and therefore Hamiltonians. Did I answer your question? Or, or in, okay, we have another question here. Yes, Paul Wessling. Intel, uh, the last week or two, announced a new cross-point memory technology. The one, in the cross, cross Intel, point. a cross-point. Right, cross-point. Should I suspect there's a memristor at the base of that somewhere? Well, of course, nobody was in there. But if they are using resistance as, as the information, it is going to be a memristor. I, 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 I will bet you on that, OK? Uh, there's no question. That's, that's my theory, OK? And, 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 and there were new rumors that there were phase change memories. Again, the Intel folks, if you're tuning in, if you're using phase change memory, you may not want to call them memory, but they are memristors. If you're not using phase change memory, but some other gadget that but uses resistance as the, as the information, they are memristors. You should start to call a spade a spade. That's what all is all about. But if it's something else, then I don't, then, then I don't know the answer. Any other questions? Yes. Hi, Leon. My name is Le Zheng and uh, Just speak a little louder, please. Yes, my name is Le Zheng and uh, you mentioned that. Uh, from, are you it, from HP? Yes. Okay. You mentioned that in order to have the action potential, ever, the coefficients have to be very accurate within one percent of accuracy. And uh, no, I didn't say that. Uh -huh. I say that f f in for the, for for the. Uh, Huskin Huxley motor mm -hmm. or the heart, it just happened to be that way. Right. I don't I don't I didn't say that it would happen every in every other system. Right. But just, just it's just curious that for the Huskin Huxley and the heart, it 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 is right in this Goldilocks zone. And I was shocked. Right. I still don't understand why. Exactly. Because this is just a theory, you know. I mean usually when you in mathematics you have a theorem and you say there exists or this is happened, normally you know it's it's quite conservative, you know, there's there's a big range, and, and you still have to you know, find the, 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 the spot where it works. This thing is almost right on. It's a, it's, it's a miracle. I don't know that. You know? So all, I'm not saying this is true in all examples. Mm -hmm. Only just happened to work for the Huskin Huxley equation for the brain and for the heart. Right. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about the same, same thing that. Uh, you know, we if we human have uh, survived all the evolution and stuff, I would think that uh, we are pretty robust systems, yeah. which means that we can adapt to various of changes. But uh, you know, but so so there is a contradiction, and in in between these two things, and I don't know how to understand that. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it uh, uh, you know this is a difficult question to answer. You know, but because we're talking. We all know that believe in evolution, you know, and, and unless you are you, you you are a very religious person, and and if, by the way, evolution is interesting, in the sense that uh, evolution is robust, and because because evolution is evolution is not engineering. Evolution doesn't give you if you're an engineer, you 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 will be filed if you don't design the best system, the optimal system. Evolution is never optimal. Evolution is when you get something that works, okay. And you just keep using it, and you just keep using it, and it still works. You keep using it; it's never optimal, and because it's, it's if you keep using it, and it means that it's robust. That's where the robustness comes from. So evolution means robustness. Okay. Um, okay. Any other question? All right. If there are no question, I'm going to come to the fun part. I think of this part. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk about the poetic characterization of the memory store. Remembrance of things, and I saw a few hands earlier, so many of you already knew what uh, this. So, Membristol, we'll talk about Membristol minds as a little bit stress or imagination of remembrance of things, past, but Allah proves, okay? Proves, uh, Allah, because it's French here. So, 
Uh, so, so it's uh, Marshall Proust, a la Richard Du, you know, the Tong Perdu. Uh, the correct translation of that is actually in search of lost time. But there were two translations. The more poetic one is the one that is more popular. It's called Remembrance of Things Past. It's okay. And I have these three books here because I'm going to quote from them. I didn't have enough time to copy the paragraph. So there's our hero, Marcel Proust. For those of you who didn't know about him, you should start. You would, I'm sure, after today's lecture. First of all, it's a 3,000-page uh, by the way, this is, is uh, Somerset Maugham. All of you certainly know Somerset Maugham. He said, this is the greatest fiction today. So you know that this, we're talking about some deep stuff here, OK? All our research is 3,200 pages long. The three volumes here, every one of them is a little bit more than 1,000 pages. That's what it is. Seven volumes at 2,000 literary characters. It's truly amazing. In fact, there are many long sentences. One of them is 950 words long. One sentence. I'll just give you the first few lines, OK? So you have to be very patient when you get to this long to, to end. But then once, after today, you will appreciate it. You will be patient because, you know, there's gold in there. You know, the nuggets that you're going to have to patient to dig it out, OK? OK. Now, this is the most beautiful sentence that I'm going to read you. And I'm not the first one who identified this in many, many books. This is, this is the classic. We're going to try this book. Proust, by the way, is not a mathematician, he's not a physicist. He's just a poet, OK? And, and yet, he's saying things just from intuition that were ex amazingly way ahead of everybody. He essentially predated, predated Pablo by at least five years, OK? So one of the sentences I'm going to read you um, I have to give you a little history so you know what I'm doing, what he's doing. Marcel Proust is all of a, belonged to a, fa a family of what I would call upper bourgeois, you know. Not, not quite aristocrat, but, but almost aristocrat and have a lot of contact, a lot of friends that are aristocrats. So they, they, they know about good living in Paris, Parisian or in the early 19th century, okay? And uh, so they, they live in Paris, but they have a weekend house. Okay, and they have relatives that are nearby. One of the relatives of Marcel Proust is uh, his aunt, Leonie, because I'm going to read things and you keep hearing about Leonie. Leonie is, is Marcel Proust's aunt. He had a beautiful house in a, in a quaint little village called Ilia. It, it's just a forward, I L I E L L I E R, Ilias. Okay, and so over the weekend, when we were young, his mother. He saw a bit of a mama boy, by the way, okay? But so so that his mother would bring him to Ilia for the weekend, and he, he just loved the town with the springs and, and the quaint church and, and, and the fields, everything, he just loved it. And then for many years later on, uh, uh, there were all kinds, of, they were interrupted by the World War I, so, so they stopped doing it, but then occasionally they still go back. And Marcel, you know, therefore, you know, but he has this great childhood memory of things. And this is where this book's all about. It, 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 it's very poetic, but if you read carefully, every sentence has to do with associated memory. This is why I'm telling town here. You know, you know, I, I'm not a poet or anything. I wouldn't be spending time reading this 3,000 book if it were not interesting, uh, if not related to, to science, okay? So one of the sentences, and you know, as I said, this is perhaps the most famous sentence that you find in many books. It started that he went back, okay, and in one of those weekends, and so, uh, he, so, so his mother brought him back, like what I mean. So, so, he, so he said, she sent for one of those squat, plum little cakes called Petite Madeleine. Now, in fact, this is, I have it something, I'm just going to read from here. Because some of them that are not here, I, I, I would have to read from here. Okay. She sent for one of those uh, squat, plum little cakes called Petite Mad Madeleine. And I, so now this, the, this is the associate member. I raised to my lips, a spoonful of the tea. This is sort of a, 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 a fragrant tea. In, in France, we don't have it in the States. They call it a teal, teal, teal. I and mean, I don't know it proper. It's a, it's a, a, a lime, lime-like kind of flavor, OK? That tea is particularly important in this story here. That's why I'm emphasizing. So I raised to my lips a spoonful of the tea in which I had soaked a morsel of the cake. No sooner had a warm liquid mixed with the crumbs touched my palate than a shudder ran through me and I stopped. Okay? Those were 
The petite model, if you've never had it, you, you know, you can buy it, I'm sure, in, you go to Trader Joe, okay? You can get that. that unfortunately, it wouldn't get teal, the teal tea, but uh, somehow the teal tea is important in this particular example, okay? And so this is the, the basic concept here. He said, I'd like Pablo, which is the meat and the ringing bell, the two senses that are, the, you know, the, 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 the eye and, and the ear, I, I mean, the, the taste quite different. This is, this is taste and smell. And you see why this is so important, okay? All right. And suddenly, the memory revealed itself. The taste was that of the little piece of madeleine, which on Sunday mornings, my Aunt Leonie used to give me, dipping it first in her own cup of tea. Taste and smell alone, more fragile, but more enduring, more unsubstantial, more persistent, more faithful, bear unflinchingly in the tiny and almost impalpable drop of their essence, the vast structure of recollection. Very poetic, but it's the word recollection that, you, that, that give it away. We are talking about associated memory here. Okay, and later on, he the mentioned didn't wouldn't have enough time to go through. He would just eat the madeleine, and he would nothing is interesting. Just drink the the teal tea, nothing. Interesting. It had to be the, the two together. It's, it's quite amazing. Okay, and so immediately, what he we, the, as soon as this get associated, what happened? He said immediately the old gray house upon the street. We're talking about uh, this little village cooked. Called Com the, the village name in the novel. By the way, the novel is all about this little village called Combre, C-O-M-B-R-A-Y, Combre. It's a fictitious village. In fact, that village is Elia. This is why in the 100th anniversary of, of uh, uh, Proust's uh, birthday, the village changed the name from Elia to Elia Combre. If you look at the map now, there's no Elia. It's Elia Combre. Okay? It is that fictitious village of the story. Okay? So, so all of a sudden, immediately the old gray house, oh, by the way, that old gray house, everything in this novel is true. Uh, it's, it's, he, he just used different names. It, the old gray house is now a museum in Combray. It's just uh, two hours south of Paris. Anyone go to Paris should take this trip. It's a beautiful village, and you go to the museum, and you see that the scenes described in his book are all in this house. The kitchen and, and, and you know to the last tiny bits. It's all in this in the stairs, you know, and, and, and this is why it's so interesting. I, I'll show you the house a little bit later if we have enough time. Okay. So immediately the old gray house upon the street where uh, her room was rose up like a stage. And with the house, the town, the square, the country rose we took. In that moment, all the flowers in the garden and in M. Swang's Park, and the water lilies, and the Yvonne, Vivant, and the good folks of the village, and the little dwelling, and the parish church. This is a beautiful parish church, by the way. I'll show you the picture shortly, okay? And the hall of Combray, and the surroundings, taking shape and solidity, sprung into being town and garden alike from my cup of tea. Very poetic, but every word there is about associated memory. All of these things come back to him. We were talking about, you know, 30 years past, and he was able to generate here. But the amazing thing about Marcel Proust is that he, not only he invented, I mean, had the intuition of assorted memory, he also discovered what memory is, in the sense that memory is false memory. You never, never, ever actually remember the same thing. And I'm going to show you why shortly, okay? So this, by the way, this is the picture. This is the, the beautiful... Uh, Church that you, if you go there, two hours from Paris, uh, is the, the original town named Ilir, and Combray is the town in the in the uh, novel. Okay, and Proust had intuited the anatomy. This is an important one. Proust had intuited the anatomy of our smell and taste processing center, which I had dubbed, I had now called it the Prussian hippocampus. Long before it was confirmed by neuroscience. You see, nobody. Knows, we, we, you know, where the, we, we, earlier I said the left hub is for uh, digital and right is analog, but nobody can pinpoint where the memory is. We still don't know today, except that, except that we now know that the hippocampus is where most of the memories are taking place. Uh, okay, and I told you, Pablo discovered the associated phenomenon, but he, he couldn't pinpoint what in the brain where this is happening. 
When Marcel Proust pinpointed, not so much that he's done an anatomy, he, he never heard of hippocampus, but he's, the fact that he said these things are associated turned out to be exactly the region. So essentially, he, he knew where it, we, we now know where that is, okay? This is because smell and taste are the only senses that connect directly to the hippocampus, the center of the brain's long-term memory. Their mark is indelible. All our other senses, the other senses, the sight, touch, and hearing, the one that Pablo had, are first processed by the thalamus. Thalamus is just a little bit farther away, but it's a station you have to go through, okay? So the source of the language and the front door to consciousness. As a result, these senses are much less efficient. In other words, sight, touch, and, and sharing, because you have to go through a, 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 a relay, it's not as efficient as, as Marcel Proust, you know, which is right next, next door to each other, okay? Neuroscience now knows that Proust was correct. In a science paper, it is now, now we're not talking about real science. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Russell Hirsch, with psychology at Brown University, has shown that our sense, sense of smell and taste are uniquely sentimental, okay? Be be and, and because Proust had led us to the simple, uh, hippocampus, smell and taste are the only senses that connect the regular hippocampus, which now we know at the center of the long-term memory. Now this is, just a quick picture. If you look at this uh, map, there's a, a, this it looks like seahorse. Hypocampus is just a Greek name for seahorse, by the way. Okay? And if you look at two that uh, in the middle part, that, there's a little thing, uh, the yellow part in the, in, in the middle of the, in, in, embedded inside the brain, that's the hypocampus. That's what your memory and my memory are there. Uh, we, we know that uh, this last part of it, they, we still don't know the whole story. Okay? And, so Proust's 300,000 page novel is sprinkled with numerous episodes of associated memory. Remembrance of things, but it's just the point equivalent of associated memory. And by the way, how, how many of you know Oliver Sacks? He was uh, another neuro professor that just died recently. He, he was so impressed. He said Proust was a neuroscientist, okay? And now this is, uh, I'm not gonna have time to go, go through that because I have only three minutes left, but he said, I drank a second mouthful in which I find nothing more than in the first, then a third, which gives me rather less than the second. It is time to stop. The potion is losing its magic. I claim, I mean, I, I, nobody I just said, Proust had discovered deja vu. It's right there, okay? That's, that's deja vu, okay? Okay, Proust remembered things as being far than they actually were. Proust was actually aware of this false progeny he knew that Combray he yearned for was not Combray that was, as Proust put it, the only paradise is paradise. He said, said the memory you had is false memory. You can concoct false memory. And there is a paper published two years ago by MIT, which showed that you can actually create false memory. And this is very, really serious because there are a lot of criminal trials where witnesses would certify and swear that they have seen the killer. And many times they were not, they were false memory. Okay, and this is science now. I'm going to, to uh, go fast because I have only two minutes left, you know, but, but this false memory is very interesting. You can create things that you don't know and it turned out that Mark Twain also re discovered that. Proust didn't know Mark Twain, I just found that out, okay? Mark Twain said, when I was young, I could remember anything, whether it happened or not. <laughs> he was talking about, he was talking about false memory, okay? And, okay, and then Proust talked about, about Searching for time, hidden space where time stops. And this is important because my last two lectures is all about time. We're going to talk about future and past. In fact, I used to, like Einstein, Marcel Proust was in a literary way, a theories of time and space. I used to give a talk uh, two weeks ago, two years ago, I called it Tomorrow Was Yesterday. This is the theme that I'm going to continue on. You know, we're going to talk about time. It's all related to Marcel Proust as well. So, present is passed by Marcel Proust. Uh, I'm going to move on since our time because uh, this is the house that's in the novel and existed is the museum now. This is exactly what you said inside preserved. It's all described in the book. Okay. I'm going to, uh, I have two minutes, I'm going to say, talk about HM. How many of you knew, knew HM or heard of HM? I gave this talk just, just uh, a year ago in London, you know. Uh, to, to a, a mixed audience, and I asked, uh, who, how many of you know HM, you know, and uh, a, a stately old lady came out and said, of course, it's Her Majesty the Queen. 
you know, HM in, the, in, the, in British is always Her Majesty. Well, it, it doesn't start, it's not Her Majesty the Queen. It's actually <coughs> Henry Molaison, who died. Just, nobody knew his name until just, just December 1, that the year when the Bristol was uh, published, okay? And before that, nobody knew who HM is, except that there is this person called HM to protect his identity. Then he passed away. But why is this important? Because HM, when he was young, he had a bicycle accident and hurt his brain. And then he developed epilepsy. So the surgeon, a very radical form. So the only way to save him is to operate. So the surgeon cut away some part where this thing is happening. And sure enough, he was, he was almost killed. He, was, he never had epilepsy again. But then the surgeon uh, soon realized that uh, he has lost something. He, he, he would be introduced to Stan five minutes ago and Ten minutes later, son would be here, and he said, who are you? He lost his short-term memory, okay? We now know that, at that point, we know that hippocampus is a beginning part of short-term memory and that's what leads to long-term memory. And I realize I, my time is up, but at least read up on the story, interesting story, HM, it's all about, about hippocampus. Hippocampus is where memory is, and this is why I'm talking about it. Thank you very much. <laughs>